Okay, so we're here for episode 22 of the Grappling with Physio podcast, and we're joined with Sean Coles from SE Vital Fitness down in Portsmouth. Sean, how are you doing? I'm good, Paul. Really, really good, buddy. And uh, how's things with you? All yeah, good? Mate. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. You know, get getting by in this COVID period. I'm looking forward yeah. to the uh, the gyms opening back up, and that that'll be uh, it'll be good to get back on the mats. You know yourself. Yeah, you and me both, mate. Once those gyms open, I know. You know, gyms are a good place and they're good for you. We talk about mental health, you know, and all the other stuff that goes with it. Gyms need to be open, but I agree with what's happening with all the COVID lockdown and stuff. So I'm not one of these that's going to kick off, but I just need to know why. I think it's when I've spoke to you time and time again, not just about this, but anything. If there's a rationale behind something, I'm with you. But if there's no clear or there's no clarity, I'm kind of confused and I hate being confused. <laughs> Sean, sure. let, 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 let's um, let's come on to that a little bit later. But in regards to how we met, we worked together back in 2011. I was actually locum in as part of the physio team on board. Uh, well, I say on board, it was on, on site on HMS Collingwood, which is a phase yeah. two training establishment. And then I think six months into that, you came in, you were posted there as an ERI, which is an exercise remedial instructor, because uh, you were part of the Navy, part of the PTI Corps, but you'd gone that rehab route. So if we just go yeah. back a little bit, um, you know, now you from Manchester originally. Yes, all the way up north. Okay, how did you end up joining the navy, and why pick the navy? Right, so it, it's family really. My dad was in the navy. Um, believe it or not, it, so I, I joined the navy as an engineer, but my, I wanted to be a chef because my dad was a chef and I liked cooking. And my mum wouldn't sign the paperwork. She turned around and said, "I'm not signing it. Your dad's got a terrible job." So. I had to, can, because I was under 18, she had to sign it. So I ended up going in as an engineer because it was, you know, if you're an engineer, apparently you're a little bit more astute, a bit clever. You've got exams to pass. And I, I did it all. Um, and I absolutely hated it because it wasn't me. I needed to do stuff that was a little bit different. So, you know, I'll, I'll go on from that, actually, because once I'd done the engineering side, at the age of around about 20, I started working out. I'd always worked out. I'd boxed and I'd done all this. I started working out, you know, and, and doing all the stuff and, and really getting good at working out. I was fit. I was strong. And I, and I thought to myself, There's, there must be something I can enjoy. I love doing fizz. So anyway, I, I, I said to myself, I'm going to go in the special forces because that's what everybody does, right? So I said, right, I'm, I'm going to go for it. So I got my running up, did everything. And at the age of 22, I went for the aptitude for a thing called 148, um, which is like a, a foreign observing battery for the SAS. And then you eventually go from that into a special forces course. It's like it would give you the tools to be better at that. And I passed it. And then at, at the same time, about 23, I passed the PT kind of aptitude. And it got to the point at 25, they said, right, you, you can you can leave the engineering branch or and communication branch I was in. So what do you want to do? So I'm sat thinking, right, I could be in the special forces. And at the point, the special forces wasn't what it is now, all glorified and all funky. It's a pro it was a proper I call like job. And um, I opted out. I went PT instead. And it was the best decision I've ever made. I don't think I'd have made a good special forces operative. Um, I'd have been fit and I, all the fizz wasn't the problem. I just didn't, I'd, I, I didn't have it in my opinion, from what I can see and learn from people, I know I didn't have it. So I went PT, <clears throat> um, best decision at about 25. And then from that, uh, it was brilliant. It, it showed me in, in a, exactly how I needed to be as a person and I grew within it. But then after a period of about six years, I thought, again, there's more. There's more. And I met a few people who were ERIs and all this stuff. And I questioned it and I said, shall I do it? But before that, I did a teaching degree because I left school with no qualifications. Ended up becoming a teacher because of the PTI. And then I went back to the ERI thing. Oh, shall I do it? And I did it again. Another game changer. Game changer for me. Um, and from being an ERI, I then went to university again and started studying at St. Mary's to be an S&C coach. I then did my accreditation with the UKSA to become an accredited S&C coach. And I always remember my mum sitting there when I had, you know, the hat and gown thing you have. 
Cap and gown, yeah. Cap and gown, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saying yeah. I left school with nothing and I've now got a cap and gown and I'm an accredited coach. I'm an ERI in the Navy. I've done all of this. Where's it all come from? And I said, I, don't, <laughs> I, have, I have no idea, but I know what it is. It, it's, I found something I liked. And when you find something you like, you're really good at it. Um, and it's not because, you know, when you're at school, you, you would be seen as a little bit daft. It's because you didn't like it. But you find something that you like, you're generally good at it and you start to progress. Um, yeah, and then to finish off a time in the Navy, I met you in my last few years. Um, and I said, I'm going to open a gym. Uh, opened a gym and kind of eight years later, three lockdowns later, I've still got a gym. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a completely different kind of gym to what it was when I opened. You know, it's... Uh, you learn in business and you learn how to do things that the military can't teach you. You have to learn that when you do it. So yeah, I'm there now. Well, I mean, Sean, that's, that's a fantastic story, honestly. Is it, and it's great having worked with you at that particular period when you were kind of, cause you did, was it 24 years or 22 years in the Navy? 24, so 23 yeah. years and seven months. Wow. So having yeah. seen you towards the end, getting ready for your resettlement and you saying, I'm going to open up this gym, and yeah. me kind of getting ready to, I was going to get ready to move back to the Midlands for the birth of my son. And mm. it was great. And to see it evolve over these years. And you're right, mate, you, you know, university, um, especially when you do a specific course, will teach you what you need to learn to do that trade or to do that course or to do that vocation. Yeah. But it doesn't teach you the business aspect of things. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Yeah, so that, that, was, that was a massive realisation. After two years of owning a gym and the missus saying to me, um, you're not earning any money. I said, I know, but it's great fun, isn't it? Because I had a gratuity from the Navy and a pension, so I didn't need a lot of money. Well, at first, you don't think you need a lot of money. And then you kind of sit there and my mates were coming and I was powerlifting in the gym. I was lifting some big tin around. A friend of mine was Britain's strongest man. He would pop up for a workout. We'd get all the steel plates out. Um, but I earned no money for two years. And my pension pot and my gratuity started disappearing. Uh, and and I, then you kind of realize that owning a gym is as a hobby is great. But actually, it's a business. And then once you get the business side of it, it then turns into an, an amazing wonderful thing to have but if you don't sort that business out it'll be your worst nightmare and your passion of trying to help people dwindles and you end up going so far down that you just don't want to do it anymore that's why gyms stop working people do it out of passion but you've got to do it for a business reason um, and you need help for that you can't do it on your own 100 percent, definitely not what measures did you uh, uh, go and uh, try and achieve to change that then sean how did you develop that business acumen? Right. So th there's a, a lot of coaches I aspire to be like, um, not just in how they coach, but how they portray themselves and how they run their business. And there's two in particular. So Michael Boyle, he runs a great setup um, in America. And it's just a rehab style setup, but with S&C. And everybody's doing very similar stuff, but with regressions and progressions. And I loved what he does, always have done. And then Eric Cressy, who deals with the baseball players, but he has 80% general pop clients. So I'm looking, elite athletes pay money, but 80% of general pop want to work with him. Why is it? So I did a bit of research, and there's a guy called Thomas Plummer. This guy is an absolute legend, right, when it comes to business, the fitness of business. So I contacted a couple of people found out he was coming to London and this was after two years of owning the gym. So I paid to visit the guy um, in a, you know, a, a seminar. And then he had a closed door session, 10 people, 500 quid each. And I said, I had no money. Be mindful. I had no money. And I said, you know what? I'm paying the money here. I paid the money. I went in the room with 10 people and it was brilliant. What he does not know about business to start you off, you know, and the thing he said to me, Anybody in this room now who hasn't got a gym, when I tell you what you need to do to get it to a business and make it into a gym, if you haven't got one already, you will leave the room and not even start. He said, if you've been, if you've been in the gym business for a year to 18 months and you sat in front of me, you've got no fucking choice. You have to go for it. And I'm sat there two years in going, right, I've got to listen. And hand on heart, I would not 
have opened a gym, have had to listen to what Thomas Plummer said because of how difficult it is to run a business as a gym. But because I was two years in, I'd committed. Um, I just said, right, let's knuckle down and go for it. And uh, I changed. I went back to the gym and I wanted to change the model. And this is the worst thing about it. I had to go in to tell people that had been there for a while that I'm changing the model and the price is going to increase and we're doing something different. Are you in or out? Um, and of course, people leave because they don't want to pay more money for a product that they didn't want to get in the first place. So they did and I lost money and it all went down. And But then it started to come back. And I've actually got two people who joined me on day one eight years ago are still with me and they love it. They've been there through everything. Um, and this, even though this is going out, you know, and people will hear this, these two don't pay as much as everybody else. And they don't, <laughs> they, they don't. I'll mute and, that and edit that bit for you, Sean. <laughs> do, doesn't matter. Right. And, and I think people will know, because when you go into my gym, I've got, a, you know, a big unit and there's two walls that are 18 feet high there's a picture of one of them on one side and one of them on the other of these two people that have been with me for eight years. Wow. So when you come in, you'll see that these two people are my long-term members. In fact, the missus, the missus was on the wall as well. I took her off, but don't, t she knows, but the, uh, <laughs> they're on the walls as you walk in. So everybody knows who they are and they're just so nice. Um, all through lockdown, They've been with me. They've been, you know, they've never, even though saying they're not paying as much as everybody else, they're still paying a lot of money. They've not cancelled their payments. They've kept coming on Zoom, contacting, sending me messages. They've just been brilliant. So along with a lot of other people, but them two in particular, you know, it's been good. That's good. I mean, that's very interesting, Sean, because it sounds like when you first got into this, you had very much a, a nice big comfort blanket, which was your pension yeah. and that kind of capital to fall back on. And when that started to dwindle down and you realized, hang on a second, I'm not making any money that really pushed you towards the, you know, well, this is painful now. Now I need to make a, you know, take this seriously. Um, and I, I went through a very similar situation myself when I, I, you know, left Collingwood. I was kind of forced. I mean, it was always I think it's always it was always in the background to set up my own practice. But a situation forced my hand, as in the person I worked for at, the, at that time. He left and took a job, a top job in Qatar, and I had a big caseload that still needed seeing, and they didn't have a, a practice or a place to practice. And it started off with me renting a room in a gym, then it kind of progressed from one clinic to two clinic, uh, then to three clinics, and then suddenly you're stretching yourself very thin. I was also working a full-time job. I was probably mm. doing about 70, 80 hours a week, and it made me ill. And I, I tried yeah. to run it for about five years, and then it got to that point because your first year, you're not supposed to make anything. Your second year, you're supposed to be breaking even. And then the third year, you're supposed to, where you're, you're supposed to turn or see a profit. And I think I did, but it wasn't much. <laughs> you know. And then the, the, the fourth year and the fifth year, it was creeping up, but it was having too much of a detrimental effect on my health then. So uh, you know, it was yeah. a, a fork in the road and an amazing opportunity for a full-time role came along. And because, you know, uh, I was expecting another child, me and my wife, it was like, no, I know what I need to do here. And when you're doing and putting that much time into it, you neglect your own fitness and your own health. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, completely agree with you. Uh, and it, I think I, I didn't actually pay myself anything at the business until year six. Wow. Because I'd, I'd messed it up so much in the first two years. Um, wasted a lot of money paying the wrong stuff out and all of that. So, yeah, and it did. It, I agree. It made me ill. Um, I was still competing in powerlifting at the time um, because I was lucky. I had the pension to fall back on, so I didn't need a lot of money, but I didn't pay myself. But instead of doing that, I started to recruit more coaches um, and salaried the coaches instead of contracting them. So because they're on salary, they're more bought in. Um, and because of that, it gave me a bit of time to look after myself. Uh, and that's one thing I, I really, if I'm honest with you, I still struggle with it now of looking after myself. I do too much. Um, and I think all business owners, are spoke, they, they all preach, take some time away, have a holiday. And I do preach that to my members about being, you know, taking time away, taking time to relax. And I am the worst one for my own advice. And I think it's because I'm trying to, 
you know, I'm trying to make a living. I'm trying to make the business successful. And it, see, before the first lockdown, I was ready to fucking go to Barbados and sit on a cruise liner <laughs> because it was doing, going so well. And I could see the projections. I'd had a meeting with the staff of our year one and our year five projections of where we were going to be and how much money the gym was going to earn and how much wages the coaches were going to get and how well we were going to do. And then I think two weeks after that meeting, lockdown happened, the first one. Wow. Um, and we, we lost, you know, loads, lo you know, two thirds revenue went, you know, all that stuff. Everybody's been in the same boat. Your momentum, you lose your momentum. Oh, yeah. 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 Which made it worse. Mm. It's, it's, it's very difficult because when you're putting your own fingerprint on something, it's hard to let go because you hold yourself, especially when it comes to that professionalism, you hold yourself so high and to hand it over to other people and trust that they see it mm. how you see it. OK, and if you if you put a picture up and you ask three people to look at it, interpret it, they'll all say something different. OK, same same with an imaging MRI or an X-ray. Yeah. Ask three different uh, you know, doctors to what they think it is, they'll all give you a slight different variation. And it's very hard, that is. It's very hard to let go when it's your own and you're trusting people, you know, to deliver to the same standard. I remember first meeting you when you walked into the rehab gym and my first impression was, God, he's intense. Yeah. <laughs> he is I... intense. <laughs> you know, because you came in and your kind of at ease or relaxed posture was my attention. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have... I have managed that. That's a really good point, actually. So it took me a long time to let go. Um, but now I have let go of a lot of aspects of it. Um, it's brilliant. So yeah, so I, I've got a, a thing that I follow. Nobody will ever be able to do it 100%. So if I'm 100%, they'll do it 70%. If you can accept that, that's great. And the other thing, you will one day... In fact, on numerous occasions, realize you're not the best coach in your own gym because you're upskilling yourself in the business and you're upskilling yourself as a businessman to run the business. All the coaches are upskilling in how they do their job and they're just surpassing you. And when you kind of realize that actually that's an amazing thing to happen, you've got a, you've got a business that's going to be really successful. So I've got my head coach is phenomenal. He does podcasts on sleep and stuff. Really, really good. The head programmer absolutely world-class programming very compared to me i'm quite loud he's quiet so two contrasting things um another two guys two coaches on the shop floor absolutely fantastic and then i've i've hired actually an admin now to take over some of the role because the business is getting bigger um and another coach so i've got how many coaches is that now six plus two admin um and it's gonna after this lockdown it's got to be the last one right and we're all gonna fly in yeah. And do really well yeah fingers crossed because <laughs> uh, you know like when it when it comes to that business aspect there are there can't be two parallels as in sean cole the world powerlifting champion and you know hall mm. of famer for the pti you can't have that same level as intensity as sean the businessman because that's not where your strength is is it that's a development thing where you're you know starting yeah. and learning and going up the hill whereas you already achieved there that name those achievements should carry you forward a little bit more do you know what I mean? And bring in the people oh, I want to train under him. Well, I'm here mm. as the figurehead. Look at my amazing staff. Aren't they an incredible, multidisciplined, well-trained, balanced team? Yeah. Well, actually, so <laughs> uh, this 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 is this is something that I think most gym owners have got to realise. And and it took me a while again. So no matter what you've done in your career, right? What you've done, so you could be a world champion. You could be, so let, let's talk, not Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, because everybody knows how good they are, right? But let's talk something. Uh, yeah, so nobody gives a fuck what I've done. Honestly, what they care about is what I can do for them. So they don't care. They come into the gym. So the head coach, Britain's strongest man at 105, lectures at the university on the master's, Right for the SNC. So he lectures there, takes sleep seminars. He does so much stuff. Nobody cares. They, right. That's nice. You've got a stammer, mate. What can you do for me? That is <laughs> all they want to know. And once I've realized that, you know, that nobody cares about what I've done or what any of the coaches have done. 
then the world is your oyster because people then start to come in for the team and what they can get from the team, not because the team have got so many quals or so many titles after the name or nobody gives a shit. They really don't. Maybe one or two, but honestly, they don't. So if you own a gym and, and you've, you're a major athlete, nobody really gives a fuck. And that is God's honest truth. <laughs> they want to know what you can do for them. They really do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you have any issues, you know, when you kind of made that business change and, and flipped it around and said, look, we've got to change our product. We're going to be changing prices. Was there quite a bit of fallout with the customers or the, or the, the members at that time? And what type of impact did that have on you, Sean? Yeah, so yeah, a lot of the members left. And understandably so, because it was a different product, right, from what they signed up to. Um, and, and that was really upsetting in the sense. But the thing that was at the forefront of my mind, right, you start to look after number one and you have to. And the number one was my family. No money comes in, we're out on the streets, right? So that's the number one priority. I've got to look after them. So I had to change the model. At the time, I had one coach employed and I was employing another coach. So the, the coach that was employed, he eventually left, went to Manchester, did some great stuff, real good guy, actually Dan Reeve, really top coach. And then the guy who was coming on board is now my head coach. I said to him, he was getting paid, he used to... um put cables in the floor, but studying at the university to be a sports coach and all this is my head coach now lectures at the university. So he's very astute, knows his stuff, very clever. I offered him a job on 16 grand a year from nearly 45, 50 K. And he took the job because he wanted to work in the industry and he wow. wanted to work in my gym. Um, and it was um, amazing for me to see. So we lost all the members. I lost a good coach to Manchester and I employed a guy who was brilliant on 16K and paid myself nothing. And we started again. So two years in, I started again, building it. And then my head programmer, he was a member. Um, he was a drummer in a band. I went to fix his shoulders and make sure his thoracic was good and stuff. And he then said, I want to be a, a trainer. I said, right, well, and I paid him 12 grand a year. For, for for nearly for what six six or eight months because I, I didn't have any money yeah. and um and now both of them have come on and they're both head programmer head coach they're they're on a lot more than that now good, good. Um, <laughs> but they stuck with it you know yeah. um because they could see i had i had this thing on my head that what i wanted to do and they wanted to be part of it uh, and yeah they've been there ever since what uh what advice, what would be the kind of, if you could give three key, three th key points of advice to anybody, let's say, let's pick a few demographics. So let's say any PTIs leaving the forces who want to yeah. kind of follow in your footsteps. If you could go back, let's say the PTI branch said, Sean, can you come back? We've got a few guys yeah. about to bounce out of here. They're going to do resettlement. Can you come in? You, you look like you're living the life. Not really understanding how much work. Yes. <laughs> Stretch you, under. <laughs> you look like you're living the life. Can you come back and talk to them? What's the, what's the three gems you're going to give them? Right. So the, the biggest one for me, find a mentor and pay them money. Don't find a mentor and just ask them questions and expect them to deliver. Find a good one and pay them money because they're worth their weight in gold, right? And think whenever you're spending money, this is the second thing, think of the return on the investment. Don't think I'm spending a thousand pound and that's it. Think of the return on the investment. If it's a thousand pounds, you get two thousand. That's you know, it's a great return. You should get more than that. So mentor, um, and pet. Uh, yeah, what was it? A mentor. Well, three what things. Three things. A mentor. Find yourself a mentor and pay him. Pay him. Pay him money. Um, so no. You know. <laughs> i'll put you on the spot here <laughs> no it's it's not even on the spot it's trying to think of three things that uh because there's so many right there's so many different things all right so get a mentor realize you're not going to be the best right at what you do um and accept it and when you're doing that accept that everybody that comes into the business will only work at 70 percent of what you can do they're never going to work any more than that even though they're going to try really hard and they'll be brilliant at it um yeah, and the biggest, the, the third thing, right, for me is integrity. So I'm massive on that. And I feel that not armed forces, a lot of people nowadays have a lack of integrity about them. 
And what tends to happen is um, they upset a few people on the way because they're just trying to make it and they lose their integrity. And what they don't realise, that there's other people who know that um, and essentially won't help them along in their journey. You know, so I know some really good guys that have left and done some great stuff. And I speak to them on a daily basis. And there's some other people that have tried to do similar things um, and stepped on too many toes that they've done it. So don't step on anybody's toes and keep your integrity. No, no, I think those are really good. I think the one thing I got from uh, having to essentially close my clinic and business down was don't be afraid to fail. Like if it doesn't work, yeah. you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean you are necessarily a failure. You just haven't managed to pull this project off. You know, nobody got hurt. You know, okay, fair enough. I got, mm. a bit, I got a bit ill and a bit stressed out, but nobody really got hurt along the way. Do you know what I mean? And it's fine. There are, I mean, I got into a lot of that. I was trying to essentially burn the candle at both ends. I, I, I did a paid mentor, did a few business courses, because like I said, the degree doesn't teach you how to run a business. I didn't no. know about the importance of separate business insurance, uh, setting the company up as a limited company. So it's therefore a separate entity. So if it does go bust, it's not me and it doesn't affect my yeah. potential to get a mortgage in the future. Um, by setting up a limited company, you now need to pay an accountant. An accountant's going to cost you at least a grand a year. Then you've got to set off uh, earnings that the business might be turning over. Not that you're going to earn anything. That money that the business earns because it's a separate entity, now you've got to pay the, your corporation tax. Then when everything's yeah. left and done and dusted, you might be able to pay yourself something out of that. And I just, uh, you know, the, the lessons I got from all of that were fantastic. And I think that was, for me, that was essentially a, a bachelor's degree condensed. Well, well I wouldn't say condensed because it was over a few years in how to not do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, De definitely. Yeah, 100 percent agree. I think that there's nothing can teach you any of that. Nothing. Just doing it getting a mentor who can set things up for you. But even then, I, you know, when we talk about mistakes, I reckon if I was to put a figure on it, of my mistakes cost me, or my learning, my learning cost me £100,000 in eight years because wow. that's how many mistakes I've made. But they're not mistakes. They're all learning opportunities, right? Yeah, so yeah. Because you can't, you can't see them as mistakes. They are a, a learning curve or an opportunity for you to develop. And Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you've got a gym business similar to mine, like a training gym, which is all personal training, uh, you've got to look to turn over um, to make yourself a good living, which everybody talks about, right? At least half a million. You, you've got to expect 500,000 turnover a year because of all the taxes and everything that go on top of it and wages and, and all the stuff that goes alongside. I mean, wages are going to be 35 to 40% of what you take in. Um, and then you've got your VAT, your corporation tax, which is going up because of COVID as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of money goes out, definitely. How, um, how did you find, I mean, I think you give yourself too much of our time here because you did study a master's whilst doing all of this, didn't you, in s &T. How did you find that, Sean? Yeah. Um, has, that been, has that benefited you in your practice? No. <laughs> God's honest truth. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. Um, all, the, all the university intakes go, oh. <laughs> no, it hasn't. And, and I'll tell you for why, because talking, right, again, nobody cares what you know and nobody cares what you've done. We can talk, right? Somebody's going to go through a lift in the gym, right? What I want you to do is make sure you, you lengthen that muscle by eccentric loading it and do some tempo. They're like, I don't really care, right? Am I going to lose weight and get strong? I'm going to, how are you going to make my weaknesses strong? They don't care all the stuff that you know. Um, so for me, it helped me knowing stuff, but I don't think it helps in the gym because when I, when I was getting people in, I learned more over the last eight years of coaching people and different personalities. And that, that's the biggest thing, different personalities. I learned more doing that than I did you know, on a master's. I know a guy who's finished his master's and he's got a football job at a football club and he's never coached anybody, right? So he may have all the ticket to say he can have the job and he's got, an, he's got, he's accredited through the UKCA, which is great to have, but it's not a coaching qual because uh, he's never coached anybody. For me, it's, 
you've, you've got to coach. You've got to work with people. There are so there's so much evidence out there that supports you know nonverbal communications, even as simple yeah. as when somebody's talking to you. You know, not making or not making eye contact, the slightest you know movement, your posture, your body language, the volume of your voice, whether it be very high, very low, the tone of your voice as well, allowing people to talk, allowing people to speak, finish their sentences, and allow, allowing them essentially mm. to you know tell you what their goals are. So let's go on to that one, Sean. Let's say there are two gyms, um, <laughs> Globo Gym, or <laughs> yeah, and then, then there's SC Vital Fitness. Let's say Average Joe's and SC Vital Fitness. Yeah. How does SC Vital Fitness from the rest of them? How are we different? Right. So I'm, we're I'm brand fully... new. I'm brand new. I'm walking in. Brand new. Street. Right. So if you were coming into me and you were going to talk to me about SC Vital Fitness, what's your goal? Brilliant. That's a great question. Yeah, that's, a, that's well, brilliant. So you've already flipped it round back onto the person. Yeah, hundred percent. So what is your goal? Let's let's do it now. What's your goal, Paul? Um, I want to get. I, I want to. I, I want to be able to deadlift my body weight. Um, no, I want to. I, I tell you what. I, I'm going to be competing in six months, so my joints need to be strong. I need to lose four kilograms. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but maintain a good certain level of muscle mass and strength because I can't bulk up too much. That'll put me into the next category. So I need to lose four kilograms uh, of, of essentially fat, but I need to get nice and strong because it, my, my uh, specific sport requires a lot of um, shooting, which is almost like a rugby mm. tackle, squatting, and I need to be able to kind of explode up from the ground onto my feet. All right. So the next question I'll ask you is, how's that going to make you feel? So have you reached that goal? How will that make you feel? Oh, make me feel great. If I could do it, it means I could compete on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, and it means I could compete. If I'm fit and strong, I could compete, and that would be fantastic. That's a dream of mine to compete on a regular basis. You know what? I can help you get to that dream. You in? Okay, I'm in. Do you see? It? Do, you see do you see what I mean? So instead of, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that um, when you come in, we're going to deadlift, we're going to do all this program, and we're going to do all this stuff. Because we can have an holistic view. I'm going to do your nutrition. We're going to teach you to deadlift. I'm going to get you to... That's bullshit. How will you feel when you get there? I will feel great. I can get yeah. that for you. Let's, okay. let's go. Let's go. I don't need to tell you how to do it. Because um, okay. we're going to do it. Right. So that's the biopsychosocial model out of the way. Now mm. let's think about the objectivity. What? How does your gym differ? Mm. Now you've done the buy-in and you've built the rapport up with the yeah. patient. What is the objective measurement you're going to be performing on me that, you know, that another gym won't necessarily do? Right. So the first thing we do with everybody, they come in and they do a full assessment. And the assessment is all about movement. So the ethos of SC Vital Fitness is move well, move often. So once we've done your movement-based assessment and we clarify how you move, we forward a note to all the coaches so they understand it. So you don't have a single coach that coaches you. All the coaches sing off the same song sheet and they coach you in a small group training environment. Once you go through this assessment and we've ascertained your movement, so say for instance, you, there's a bit of mobility stability issues in various different aspects, is prerequisites. So you have to be able to go through a three different levels. The first level, if you were gonna squat for instance, would be a body weight squat for 10 reps for good form. And then we'd move on to half body weight with a goblet, and then we move on to, um, sorry, then it'd be quarter body weight for 10 reps, then half body weight goblet squat for five reps. So if you're a 100 kilo guy, I want you to pick the 50 kilo um, dumbbell up and squat it for five, right? Just five reps. And if you can do that, then we'll back squat you. Same as deadlift. We, go, we start with a hinge. We start with getting this, the swing going on the kettlebell. We start with getting into your position. You'll go down to three blocks from the floor, one block, then no blocks from the floor. Then we can talk about how much you're going to lift. So you have to go through all of these tickets and get ticks in the boxes before I'll move you on. Then I'm going to test your cardiovascular fitness. Now, this is over a process of 36 months. Brilliant. So wow. <laughs> the, gym, the gym does six weeks and the six weeks of foundation. And we do the whole foundation for six weeks. And you pay for that. At the end of the foundation, you can stay and do more stuff. Or you can take what I've taught you, how to lift properly, all your nutrition and go and use it in another gym. 80% of people stay and they come with us and they do a 36 month journey. They can opt out when they want, but for 36 months, they go to certain modules. Module one could be 
eat protein three times a day, drink three liters of water and sleep for seven hours. Tick them off every day. You've passed module one. Module two would be, and so on and so forth, until we hit every aspect of nutrition and fitness, but not all at once. Good. Does that make so, sense? Yeah, no, it sounds, it sounds great. I, I couldn't imagine having had that much advice, education, that, that fundamental base of, of good knowledge, looking at movement, looking at your baseline cardiorespiratory, yeah. maybe fat calibration, other measurements yes. that you take as well. So all Everything. of these things, why would anybody want to leave and then go in another gym where there's a likelihood if they go into the squat rack, somebody's going to be bicep curling with the barbell? So you, you know why people, well, well, it's true. People do leave, right? Because there's, there, there's, the, um, there's a lifetime value of a member of a facility. It's usually nine months, right? Ours is three and a half years. That's the average lifetime value, which is really, really good. Um, and people do leave because I call it chapters. So there's 20 chapters in a book. Chapters one to seven, they're with me. And they may leave chapters seven to 12. But if I'm an asshole... They're not going to come back. But if I go, yeah, you know, it's it, different chapters in your life. They may come back. And we have had that on numerous occasions. They come back and join in again and enter into those chapters. So, you know, people do leave. But, you know, we have a an, an attrition rate, which in standards 30% in training gyms. Ours is 2%. So our attrition, people leaving, is 2% a, a month. But over a year, it you know, we might have nobody leave for three months and then a couple of months later, you might have one or two or whatever. We don't have many people leave. That's brilliant. No, mm. That's really good, Sean. When yeah. I think it's always the best. Um, it's the best. I completely agree. I mean, where I started BJJ is not where I currently train at the moment, you know, and, and I, I moved because, you know, I went to a gym where there was essentially one of the founding members in the UK, like a multiple world champion, and he was down the road. So you do, I think that's, I've got to go back against what you said earlier. That is where you do care about what they've done or what they're teaching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because he's essentially on the map with you, you know, and, and it's, you can't, you get a lot of um, learning from that or knowledge, so to speak. But then obviously with COVID, that, uh, yeah, there was no way I could make that work, you know, that gym in Birmingham. No. So it was, it was back to, you know, training at a, a, another friend's gym. But it, it's fine. People do move around and people do float, you know, from various locations to locations. They could be working down in Portsmouth for a certain period and then just think, well, well you know, contract's up now. I've got a, I've got a bug out. There's me. Mm. I'm off. Thanks very much. Have a great time. I'll stay in touch on social media. Yeah, it, it, um, even though I've said there's different chapters and I'm not, it still pisses me off. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And, and any gym owner that says it doesn't is, is, is lying because you put, say for instance, you've got somebody with you for two years and you put so much effort and time into doing everything and they go, I'm done now. You, you are, hang on a minute, but it's controlling the controllable, right? So we say it to our guys all the time. Can you control what's going on in that person's life? No, you can't. So control what you can be nice. They'll leave. If they come back, brilliant. If you want them back, that is. Some you might not. But 90% of the people that leave, we genuinely want them to come back and, and enjoy because the gyms evolved so much. When they come back, it's a better product. Um, and it always is. These lockdowns have been, from a positive way, uh, made the gym industry, and in particular my gym, probably 200% better than it was before the first lockdown. It really, really has developed us into a, a different animal. It really, really has. Uh, so I think the lockdown has been brilliant for us, if I'm honest with you. Really, really good. How has it kind of, how, let's go with that, Sean. How's it changed mm. then? What have you done? Have you adapted to that? Right. So but before the first lockdown in March, we had a great setup and the gym was working well, um, but there was holes in the business. So, and my job was to patch these holes, to, to stop things, you know, like if you've got a boat, has got holes in, to stop them leaking. But to try and do it while a gym is operating is very difficult because you've got people doing this and doing that. So when the gym closed, I filled up three skips full of rubbish and, and I reset the whole system within the gym and we developed our own internal app. So, you know, you've got Facebook is a community-based app, right? That's what Facebook, we've got our own. It's our own internal community app 
we developed that over the lockdown. So now instead of people going on Facebook and watching funny cat videos, all they can see is stuff from us. There's no adverts. There's nothing. There's just SC Vital Fitness stuff. Um, the programming's completely changed. So we used to do a lot of Olympic lifting and things in sessions, and it doesn't work because there's a, a bit of displacement. We still do it, but we do it separate. So we took it out. So the programming's all changed. Um, the onboarding sequence for people coming on board, we just stopped what we were doing because we did COVID, got rid of it and started a new one. Um, we've changed absolutely everything from the top to the bottom. Programming, how we interact with the clients, the onboarding, the ethos has always stayed, but we did a new kind of look at how we do things as a staff. It wasn't just me, the staff did it. Um, we've changed absolutely everything. Even even the gym space, we spent 40, 50 grand on a new gym flooring and moving the racks and stuff to go in line with COVID. So we've invested all heavily in a, a, a lot of kit. Um, yeah, and it is a brilliant place now. I'm not just saying that because I own it. It is a world-class gym. It really, really is. Um, are you kind of, you know, when all this eventually goes and stuff, are you going to be running? Because you've run a few seminars in the past, haven't you, for you know, other people in the industry, you're going to keep up that educational process as well, where you do the train the trainer aspect of things. Yeah, so 100%. So what we did because of we learned that we're actually really good at what we're doing. Um, and the coaches are great. The next step for any coach, when when you speak to them, is I'd love to coach coaches, and they always want to aspire to that. So I had two choices. So my coaches would eventually leave, right? Because they want to go and coach coaches, because it's the next step. So why don't I just um, put a personal training course together, fully accredited, not just a, a dog shit course, fully accredited. You'll be a level three PT. So we did. And we started it, um, supposed to start in January, but because of lockdown, we didn't. So we've developed the course and the coaches within the gym after the first one, they'll be coaching that. They'll get extra money, which is great, but they'll do the thing they want to do is coach coaches. So I'm going to keep my good guys. The ones who are good at coaching in the gym, the ones that can coach coaches. So with that, yeah. And then all the seminars we do, the members essentially can log into any seminar as part of their membership. And we try to do some in-house, some in, some in Zoom. So if we get speakers in ourselves, we bring the members in. Or yeah, 100%. We love doing the seminars. Brilliant. That sounds really good, Sean. I don't mm. think, um, I think sometimes... <laughs> You don't realize what how good it is until what you're telling me now it sounds absolutely fantastic it's almost like a, a gym stroke university of fitness <laughs> yeah it, it, it is I, I must admit it is i do love what i do and i'm passionate about the gym but that passion dwindled after two years when i had no money and i had my head up my ass but because of the staff i've got and the members we've got now, it, honestly, it is brilliant. If you met some of the people, not just the coaches, the members and how they portray themselves and how they are, and just we've become friends, but they, they understand it's a business. They just understand everything about it. Um, it is one of the best places to work in the UK, if not the world. And the members are some of the, the best people you could ever wish to meet. And they've kept the gym where it is and made it how it is. It's not just me sean who's opened a gym and made it as it is it's been made up of so many different people so many different elements even people that have left have had an impact on what we've done you know uh, so yeah i can't thank everybody enough really for what they've done you've worked so hard over the years sean to build a good solid brand have you ever considered franchising or is that something that just doesn't even interest you this is the control thing, right? So if you franchise, you can't control what's going on, you, you know, and you could to a degree for me, if I was going to franchise, I've already thought of it. I would have to pay for, so say for instance, I opened a gym and I needed five coaches. They would have to come and work at SC Vital Fitness number one for a year before I'd even entertain opening a facility with them for a year, but I have to pay them for that, right? Because I'd want them to understand the ethos behind it all. Um, so I wouldn't want to franchise because I think it dilutes what you've got, me personally. Um, but I would love to open another space, maybe three spaces, but all within close proximity so I can go and visit. 
Um, but the problem is, and I think with any business owner, and you probably experienced it yourself, Paul, it's staff. So I've had some brilliant staff over the years. I've had some not so brilliant staff. Uh, and that is the biggest issue and the biggest headache, trying to get the right people to do the right things. Uh, Whenever you've got to manage people, you've always got to manage problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, go on, and the, go on. <laughs> no, no, the, big, the bigger you get, the more people you get, the worse it gets. Um, it does. It does. And, and that's one thing I never, I, I, for me, right? <laughs> you know, and I speak to my head coach about this because he's funny. He makes me laugh. But me and him chat and we go, so if, if me and you were chatting, Paul, and I said, right, Paul, um, we're going to, tomorrow we're going to meet at six. If you update the social media for me tomorrow at 6.15, I'll make the coffee. Oh, you sure, you make a good coffee. You do exactly. make a good coffee, mate. Yeah. I've got to thank you for that's one thing you taught me how to lift <laughs> and how to appreciate a good cup of coffee. But no. <laughs> that's it. But if, if we said that, you'd be like, right, okay, and we do it, right? That's <laughs> what we week. do. Yeah. But then when, and that's that's the problem. People aren't like that. They they interpret it a different way. And I don't understand how you can't how you people interpret stuff sometimes and it but i've now got to understand people do they interpret things their own way so there's we have a clarity and confidence scale is it like that so clarity and confidence are you clear and are you confident i'm clear on what you want me to do but i'm not confident then that's my fault but if they say they're clear and confident it's their fault so we run that scale um and then the you ever heard of the salt shaker no you ever heard so you've got a salt shaker well i'm going to let me put this. So where's that? Is that in the middle of the screen? Uh, go to your right a bit. There? No, other way, other way. That way? Still, yeah. You, you'd yeah. say that's in the middle? Yeah. <laughs> what have I told you that was the middle? <laughs> but you're not in the middle. You're slightly off. <laughs> what? But hang on, so you're saying this is the middle? <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm going to tell you this I'm is, the, this, yeah, yeah, this is yeah. the middle. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. The, that's the salt shaker. So you have a salt shaker and you put it in the middle of the table and somebody moves it and says, well, I believe the middle's there. That's their opinion, even though they might be fucking wrong and it may not look like it's in the middle. So I have to, I've realized over years to remember not everybody has the same idea. Not everybody interprets what you're saying in the way you're thinking. So just chill out. And not everyone was, has done 24 years or even day, a few days in the Navy. <laughs> no, no. Did you think yeah. sometimes, I mean, I, I think back to my own time. I mean, it was six years, but, you know, so it wasn't long and it wasn't a full career, but it was a really intense six years in the army and the guards, when they say bullshit baffles brains and the guards mm. are the best at doing all of that. Sometimes that was when I was going to uni. I mean, I was going to uni having done operational tours and been living abroad and stuff. And then suddenly I was in a classroom of 18 year olds and they're like, I'm stressed. I've had to get up at nine o'clock this morning. I was like, <laughs> You know, we, <laughs> you know, but and it can be really, um, it can be quite detrimental sometimes. The regimental life that you live, it can, it can be, keep you a little bit tunnel vision and stop being a little bit open minded and and like what you said, understanding or empathising with other people's perspective. Yeah, it's it's called their model of the world. So their model of the world is this. Yours is this. You know, it's the same planet. Um, but they have their well, I think they're on another fucking planet sometimes, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> but now I understand that. Um it it kind of makes more sense that they're they're just and, and they they're thinking the same about me. Don't get me wrong, they're thinking this guy's fucking crazy because he's thinking this. You know, of course they are. But um yeah, we're all different. We have different models of the world. And now I've, I don't accept it all the time, but 90% of the time I've learned to accept that sometimes I might be a bit too abrupt and a little bit too overwhelming. But what I said, this is only probably six months ago, I got my head coach and head programmer in on their own. And I said to them, I said, look, if you ever see me going a little bit too much and a bit abrupt with everybody, fucking pull me to one side and tell me because I know they wouldn't so I said you need to tell me because sometimes I'll say 
the wrong thing because so we talk about things and somebody doesn't do it and I'm too abrupt and too aggressive. Not aggressive as I'm going to beat people up. I mean, just the way I come across. So I need to chill out. So them two are my policemen that sort me out. That's good. Well, I suppose, that, you know, that must have been a big learning curve as well, Sean, going from the PTI branch. I mean, well, especially moving into the ERI, you're still mm. dealing with motivated, well-motivated people. The forces are motivated. Well, the majority of them are motivated <laughs> yeah. to, get, yeah, to get fit. And, and, and to, yeah, <laughs> you're going to test to that. Um, yeah. You know, some are motivated and some are, well, the majority are motivated. But um, if, even if they're not, they are still it's ingrained that you have to follow orders. So it's like, look, pick up your towel. Mm. Yeah, no problem. All right. It, it, whereas it's a completely different thing in civilian street. And when you leave. Yeah, it, it, it is a little bit different, but I think when I learned the clarity and confidence scale, that helped me. So instead of me just saying monkey see monkey do, which is what the military is, right. I'd say, are you clear? Yeah. Are you confident? I need you to be honest with me. No, I'm not confident. I really don't understand so once I've figured that out, um, yeah, that, that's been the game changer. But the best thing is as well, when they say they're clear and confident and they fuck it up, it gives me ammunition. See, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're like, wow, you said you were clear and confident. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you, you lie like a cheap Japanese watch. <laughs> yeah, 100%, 100%. That's the hardest bit. Are there any aspects of the military that you miss, Sean? None. You know, and, and I'll tell you why. So a lot of people, when they leave the military, they miss the camaraderie of being in the environment. Now, I was Navy and I went away. I mean, I've got a, a, a reunion coming up this year. We went away of 52 of us in one mess square, probably as big as, you know, some, you know, two lounges in a house, two living rooms, not very big at all. And it's just the best feeling in the world going away with all the boys and having a good laugh. So if you're going to leave the military and you open a gym like mine, a community, it's exactly the same as being in the military. Everybody's in one big room, you're having the crack, you go out for beers. So the reason I don't miss aspects of the military, which I enjoyed, which is the camaraderie, the banter, the laughs, the beers, I'm doing all of that. I've not stopped doing it. And it's because of the people within the community of the gym. Um, so I do feel for guys who may leave and maybe go out on their own and do something. I've never done that. I've always been with a group of people, so I don't miss any aspect at all. That's very good. That's good. Mm. Um, there's quite a lot of... Um, it's good what you were saying about the gym and the time that you invest into, essentially, your customers and the people, or your members. Maybe not mm. customers, the right terminology there. Yeah, your members. Members, members yeah. Because they are essentially members, and it, it is a good amount of time and a lot of kind of background work that goes in to help them get to their kind of well their goals essentially mm. there's a lot yeah of, there's a lot of faff out there isn't there sean a lot of shit on you know instagram and social media on youtube and it's filtering through it i mean there's some of the stuff like i see even from rehab perspectives i just i want to bite me flipping fingers off it's very yeah. cringeworthy and I, I i don't understand how people buy into it sometimes it, it, I know why they buy into it because they're, they're, you know, the way I talk to you about when people join the gym, what do you want? So somebody who's selling a product, right? What, what do you want to, I want to lose weight. You know, I can, I can do that for you with this. That's it. They're, they're providing them with the, the answer. There's a result you're going to get. So that's why people fall for it. But when people come to me, I, I say the same thing. I can get you a result. And there's three supplements we always give them. You know, I'm going to be honest with you, three supplements, and I'm not an advocate of supplements. It's fucking sleep, fresh air and water, and they cost nothing. <laughs> right? And God's on it, you can research the shit out of this. If somebody sleeps for more than seven hours a night, they're less likely to get ill. Their immune system is higher than somebody who sleeps five hours. If somebody gets out in the fresh air, the vitamin D aspects of being in the fresh air and the cardiovascular elements of getting your heart rate up are better for losing weight than anything. Right, so you've got sleep, fresh air, and water. All products that sell and claim to have a dietary effect all say on the back, as long as you're taking it with water, because water is the biggest thing. Three liters of water, fresh air, and sleep. Free. Three supplements that cost you nothing and will do more for you than any purchase supplement on the market. Fact. And I'm, I hate saying fact as well, but it's so true. 
I really triggered you there. Your your you your, your work buddy's gonna be coming in. Go, Sean. Now's the time for you to calm down, okay? Yeah. <laughs> the, I, I I you you know I've always had an issue with stuff that people sell. They sell products. I sell a product, right? I sell a, a gym membership with personal training, with diet and nutrition advice, right? They sell the same thing and say the same same questions. But what I personally believe I do right, as I don't lie, I tell them the truth. It's hard work. Um, but, you know, expectations versus reality. What you put in, you get out. Um, if people realize that, if you've been fat for six years, overweight for six years, it's not going to be six weeks to get to lose that fat. This first six weeks we do with you is a foundation. If you do the stuff afterwards, I could help you. And I'll guarantee your result. If you do exactly everything we say, I'll guarantee it or I'll give you your money back. Um, and they're like, right, they're in. Because why yeah. wouldn't they? Yeah, it's 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 very difficult. It's the same. Um, it's when you get people with chronic pain and you say, look, the key mm. to have it here is the word chronic. You've had this for a long time. It's going to take a lot of work. Okay, well, how, how long are we looking at? And, and it's very hard for me as a physiotherapist to say, well, and, and I don't say this, and maybe in practice I would get people to buy into rehab courses. Um, but I would say, well, you need to work at this. And if you can do it by yourself, then fantastic. But it's going to be six months before you start noticing any difference. And they're like, six months? And you're yeah. like, well, yeah. Uh, you know, sorry. And I'm like, oh, God. Well, I can just go to my chiropractor or, and, and I'm, you know, I'm paying £45 for 10 minutes to crack your back once a week or two weeks. And I'm like, well, that's great. If you can afford to do that, then fantastic. Because I don't particularly want to work with you, all right? Because you're not motivated. You have no internal locus of control. You don't want to yeah. change. You clearly, you, you clearly don't want to change. Um, you know, and you don't want to take any ownership for this because the fact that your back hurts is probably because you're immobile, you're sedentary. You don't do enough exercise. You're carrying a bit of extra weight and you're not hydrated. All of these, like, very similar to what you said yourself. And it, it, it's hard. It is hard to get to get people to you know buy into that aspect. Yeah, uh, it's the readiness for change. So we do all of that. The goal setting form is how's it going to make you feel. And every time somebody says is says something back after a few weeks, oh, you know, you show them their goals and say, look, you said it was going to make you feel great. You know, it's intrinsic motivation which you lamented to there. Is you know, we get phone calls. Why do you want to? I just want somebody to motivate me. Right, listen. That that's the person we don't take on as a member because I can't motivate you. You've got to motivate yourself. If you can't motivate yourself and you're not ready for change, you know, I can get you in and you'll last, I don't know. You, you won't last long. You need that intrinsic motivation. I can facilitate it because I've got a lot of knowledge. I can help all the stuff that you need. I can put you through stuff. I can really delve down deep and really help you out. But you've got to have it from within. If you don't have that, then it's never going to work, no matter who the trainer is, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, it's very, it's not just the trainer, Sean, it's the therapist as well. You can yeah, have yeah. the best rapport with the person. And if you start talking about, well, you know, this is a kind of longstanding chronic pain, we need a periodization phase of the next three months where we start making subtle changes mm. that tiptoe into your lifestyle. Uh, and then by the time you've done that, you'll have good uh, adaptation with your muscles. Uh, and they're just looking at you going, uh, uh, how much is this going to cost? <laughs> yeah. And you go, well, it could cost you an initial payment over six months of £700, or you can wait till your knees blow out. And in about five years, a surgeon will charge you if you go privately four grand to replace one either knee. And then you can yeah. deal with all the outcome of the medical problems that you'll probably end up getting. <laughs> yeah yeah i know you. so when they when they say to me people come in and they go yeah i've got this osteopath i've been seeing him um every month for the last six years and my reply is always so imagine if you got your car and you took it to a garage every month for six years for him to fix it and it still wasn't fixed would you keep going back they went nah it'd be st stupid idea and i went fucking hell listen to what you're saying to yourself you need a long-term plan and you need to work with it and not just keep getting your back cracked or your neck cricked or whatever it is. I completely agree. No, no, he's he that osteopath, he or she is very or chiropractor or physio, whatever, whoever they are, they're more than happy because they're buying a new set of golf clubs with that money. And you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, it, and it, it's unfortunate, like it is it, it really unfortunate that people, um, and, and practitioners sometimes don't have a very honest, um, 
conversation. And when you do, I had, a, I had an amazing experience when I was in private practice and uh, I had a, a bloke, it was, the, it was a guy, his name's called Mark Smith. He's a great, we be, we've become great friends. He's the person that got me into, into jiu-jitsu, into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Because mm. um, I wasn't boxing, I wasn't training boxing anymore. And he came in and uh, he said, um, he said, look, uh, I've got a bad knee. And I said, oh, okay, let's have a look. So we did an assessment on him. Now he waited for me to finish the assessment. And he said, what's the best thing to do? I said, you need to get back to your GP. I'll do you a letter. Okay, you need to go for an MRI. Okay, there's some internal damage, but I, you need to confirm it with an MRI. I think you're going to need an operation because I suspect you've got a bucket handle tear. There's quite a few positives there. Mm. So his, his meniscus was, he went, really? I went, yeah, yeah. I says, there's nothing I can do for you until you do this. And he was like, oh. And I said, you look shocked. He went, well, I've had 16 sessions with chiropractors who were saying you need to do, it's in it's in your back. Your pelvis is out of alignment. <laughs> That's let yeah. you. You walk in funny. No, it was because you were on the mat and somebody did a knee bar and they tore your meniscus. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. he went off. He had his operation. We did some rehab. After he came back, he said, I was so impressed with your honesty. He said, can I do my rehab with you? We did some rehab. He went and competed. He did great in the British Masters. Fantastic. We've been great mates ever since. And he's the yeah. amount of people, like what you said, integrity, the amount of people um, that he sent my way when I was running the practice was just phenomenal. Oh, Smithy gave me a number. Can you sort me out? And he's like, yeah, no problem. Uh, but there's only once, there's only once I've ever been hoodwinked in the clinic where it, uh, I presented with somebody and he had a hamstring uh, in, uh, sorry, ham, hamstring insertion issue, and that was because he was training for a marathon. And I did. And this is the problem. Sometimes you got to take a step back. Mm. It was a long day. I'd seen a lot of patients, and you get very good at honing in and focusing in on what could be the the biomedical model, you know. And the fact of the matter was, I'd missed the greater picture. He never trained for a marathon before. He'd been training eight weeks, and at the two mile point, he was starting to fatigue. And he was starting to get a bit of, you know, uh, tendonitis because his hamstrings weren't adapted. He, he sat down, he did a desk-based job, and they weren't used to that amount of load or work. And I, I, I just couldn't. There was no specific test, you know, that I was doing yeah. an orthopedic test. And I was going, I can't reproduce your symptoms. I can't seem to find out. Nothing I'm palpating is causing any pain. And I was literally just scratching my head going, I don't know what's going on here. I had to go back. And I remember chatting to the wife, who's a physio as well, I think she was cooking at the time and I'm talking to her about this case and she was just, I think she was like stirring, you know, some soup and she went, oh, sounds like he hasn't got the endurance for it. And I just went. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him on that session, I'm not going to charge you. Okay. But I want to see you next week where I will have an answer. And it forced me to go away and find out why I wasn't able. So they just palming them off and saying, oh, yeah. it could be this, it could be that, you know, Let's do some cupping. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's stick some magic needles in you. <laughs> I couldn't get to a diagnosis. So because I couldn't get to a diagnosis, I couldn't do a treatment plan and I couldn't give him a solution to his problem. But it made me go away and really focus and, you know, uh, ball it back with the missus. And, and then I had this happy accident where I was like, oh, my God, you're right. He, he's got no yeah. endurance. Yeah. And it, it, I know what you mean. It's when you, we get people in, so we're not obviously physios, but when we get people in like that on a different note, so say it's a mental health issue, right? Um, somebody comes in and they're so kind of like, they need, they need a counselor. They don't need a gym. We refer them. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I want to talk, you know, touched on this actually, because a lot of trainers at the moment, because of COVID, when people are going to my mental health issues, they're thinking they're fucking counselors and they're trying to get these. They are, they're, they're in there going, yeah, what we need to do is sit down and chat. Right. And the trainer will say they've had a mental health issue and that's why they're able to help. That's like me saying, I've had a meniscus hop. When your knee's sore, come to me, I'll fucking operate on it. It's not going to happen. And all of the, it's good. You must see it in the industry. Somebody will come in with it, a mental health issue. And the trainer will say they can deal with it. Same as on forums on Facebook. If anybody has got a PT, right, go on Facebook, some of the forums on there, add yourself to them, and then your PT will be on there saying, how did my, my, my clients come in and they said they've got lower back pain? 
Is there anybody got any ideas of what I can do with them? Fucking refer them. That's what I'm saying. Stop trying to do it because it happens all the time. And that's what you were saying there. You found out that you're a physio. You've got a physio to talk to. This is PTs trying to deal with mental health, injuries that they shouldn't be dealing with, um, and athletes. I've got a boxer in. He's got this. I've got that. What do you think? I could, oh, for fuck's sake, mate. You're not a boxing coach. You've done some pad work on a on a pad work course that you were there for one day. Give the lab to somebody who knows what they're doing. But it's true, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of people that work in the industry that overstep their scope of practice and massively, that, that, and that is the mo- the most important thing. And what I I think because the fitness industry isn't heavily regulated, physio is. Mm. You know, if I, I if I overstep the mark and I suddenly think I'm a I'm a, a mental health or a CBT therapist, a cognitive behavioural therapist, and I start counselling people, and that person makes a complaint, well, I'll get struck off. You know, if I yeah. if I do anything outside of my scope of practice, I could there will be consequences, and that is essentially you know you're accountable for your actions. And I think because it's not heavily regulated, people like you said can do a bit of a Mickey Mouse you know training course, have a bit of background yeah. knowledge, and then all of a sudden think you know, or maybe not so much it's their own ego. They may feel just obliged. Well, I'm getting paid by this person. I need to give them answers. And it's just like, like what you said. The best thing you can do is recognize this is outside of my scope of practice. Yes. I'm not going to be able to do anything. What you need is a professional. Go and see them. When they give you yes. the tick in the box or the green light, come back to me. Yeah, 100%. If somebody's, so if somebody's got an eating disorder, right, and, and they say it to you when you're a PT and they go, right, can we talk about diet and nutrition? And you give them diet and nutrition advice. You're not qualified to either. And they've got an eating disorder. That can make that person go so far back into what they had before that you have now caused a mental health issue from an eating disorder, even worse so, because you think you can help because you may have had some problems with food. Yeah, that, that's, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing it at all. It really frustrating. And you see it all throughout the industry and you're right it's because it's not regulated too many people step over the mark and go outside their scope of practice numerous times a a guy come to me right he had a peck imbalance right i I don't know what it was because i never really got that far into it his pt was making him do press-ups on different levels so he was doing press-ups like this all the time and he did this for six months he said my shoulders really hurt i said i'm not fucking surprised I said, why didn't he just refer you to a physio? He said, why? He said he knew what he was doing. He's a PT, isn't he? Because everybody assumes a personal trainer knows what they're talking about when it comes to exercise. They do to a degree. And there's some, believe me, there's some cracking personal trainers out there. Amazing. But there's also some, some right fuckwits. You know what yeah. I mean? You think they're yeah. physios yeah. and mental yeah. health counselors and stuff. Yeah. It's unfortunate. It's funny when you see, um, you know, when you see the memes. I think me and you shared one a while ago. And it was the guy on the actual Swiss ball, or was it a Bosu ball? And he was squatting. Yes. And you're yes. just going, oh my God, that is just an accident waiting to happen. It's just, it's horrendous. Um, how have you kind of managed to, because you were quite vocal initially when with mm. all of that, um, you know, coming in and saying, no, you're talking shit, you shouldn't be doing that. When did you kind of rein that in, Sean, or have you? <laughs> what the. <laughs> What being more vocal on social yeah, media? Social media, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so again, I kind of sharply realised that, you know, you can alienate people quite easily. Um, and even if you've got an opinion and it's a good opinion about somebody doing a squat on a Swiss ball, it's your opinion. Nobody really cares. Um, it might raise a few jokes and a bit of a laugh with other people. But in all honesty, um, James Smith, he, the PT who does it online, he's very good at it. That's his thing. Um, I think he's brilliant at what he does to engage his people, but he engages mostly other trainers um, than actual normal people. So I stopped doing that a long time ago. I still put out posts and blogs and talk about the industry from within, but I reference everything now um, and give solid advice as opposed to, you know, opinion going down. Opinion. The, yeah. 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 A more evidence-based kind of, you know, look, yes. there's a bit of proof behind this or evidence or rather than just, just this Sean Cole's opinion. Um, yeah. I'm conscious of the time, Sean, we've had a, a great night. Let's wrap it yeah. up with a few kind of like favourite um, compound movements or exercises. So back squat versus Zerka squat. Why, are we, why is everyone doing this Zerka, Zerka or Zerka squat nowadays? 
Right, Zercher squat is brilliant. Front loaded, front loaded, and I suppose for jujitsu and things, it's probably a great exercise to do for fighting sports. Um, back squat, loads of axial loading. Zercher squat, probably none. Right, so I like a Zercher squat, but I just don't go heavy on it. Cool. Uh, snatch or deadlift? Sorry, deadlift. Uh, sorry, sorry um, clean and jerk or uh, um, snatch? Snatch. Clean and jerk or snatch? Clean yeah. and jerk. Uh, clean and jerk. The snatch, thoracic limitations on that for most people. Um, if honest, just the clean, not the jerk side of it as well, because everybody yeah. fucks that up. If, if if somebody's coming in and they want to, they, they've maybe what's in a, a CrossFit snap, you know, snippet, and yeah. um, uh, <laughs> you bite your lip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> they in a, a little kind of 30 second and they're like, right, Sean, I want, I want, to, I want to do all the, the, the Gucci stuff. I want to learn all of these mm. lifts. What's the kind of, you know, what are you, what's your spiel? Well, what's the, the, the method that you say to them? Yeah, so we, I say, what's your goal? I want to do that. Let's do a movement-based assessment. So right. I do a movement-based assessment, and then I try to keep everything positive in the assessment. But if they say, I want to do a snatch, I'll point out a limitation they may have. Let's face it, most people sh are not designed to do a full snatch. Um, it's very difficult to get into the bottom position. So I would show them. I'd say, look, this is what you need to do to be able to accomplish that. Um, can you do it? And they're like, no. I said, we can work on thoracic, but you, you can't work on limb length. You know, it's there, isn't it? And there's certain aspects you can't work on. Uh, and if they do get to a point where they, they get it, yeah, of course I'd work with them and do it. But 90% of people shouldn't be snatching. I, um, I think it was, I went up to the, I worked at the Commonwealth Games up in Glasgow. It was a couple of years. It was 2014. So it was a few years mm. after we'd uh, departed ways and left in Collingwood. And one day they were like, can you go and cover down in this place called Ravens Craig? And that's where all the Olympic lifters were warming up. Wow. And, um, and all of the uh, Greco-Roman wrestlers. So I was like, right, well, I've got two hours. So I'm going to do watch an hour of, of both of them. So I went and watched all of the Olympic lifters warming up. Oh, my mm. God, Sean, I tell you what. Now, some of them, they, so they had a whole platform on the left where it was Swiss balls and just big long poles or sticks where they went through loads of mobility. Mm -hmm. And you saw them, some of them just on the mats, just twisted up like pretzels, pulling their bodies, friends, helping them, stretching, moving in. And then they moved on to the mat. And then the coach would walk up and down. Okay, so they started off just on the barbell. All right. Yeah. And then it was all about the positions. So they would practice holding, breathing, and then just going from, let's say, thighs to chest, a massive ah, exhalation of breath, you know, working on the explosion of the movement. And then the coach would literally increment each platform. So they started going up to their 80% and then work towards, none of them went like, you know, because I would say, what are they working towards? He says, oh, in training, just 80%. And then they're ready to go onto the podium or the platform and then they're warmed up, yeah. so to speak. But it was incredible. The amount of skill applied, you know, and, and the efficiency in the movement but all of the back work that went into it, you know, so it was like 45 minutes before they even got onto the podium. That's it. You know, and it was the same with the wrestlers. When I watched the Greco-Roman wrestlers, just phenomenal. The amount of movement and warming up of their body and prep that they were doing, it, it was just incredible. That was a great experience, though, for me. Um, that must have been brilliant, mate. I'd have loved to have seen that, to be honest. Yeah, it was. It was good. I was mm. attached to swimming. and um, But to be honest, like it was a great experience because I got to watch everything for free. But in regards to patient contact hours, I was up there for, I was, I did two shifts of four days. So four days on, four days off, and then back on for four days. Okay. In those, in those eight days, I probably saw about four patients. Really? Because, well, yeah, because you're dealing with people at the, the, yeah. the, the, the top end, the 1% the fittest people and if they've got an injury, they're not even going. So some of mm -hmm. them will just go in and say, look, I feel a bit tense. You know, yeah, just jump on there, do some soft tissue release, no problem. You know, so I, I work with swimming, which was great. Um, so we practice actions on, you know, divers hitting the bottom or not recovering. And then we were doing spinal boarding out the pool. And that was really good. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, be the best part of that, about it was not the fact that I got to treat patients, I got to watch the Commonwealth Games for free, basically. So yeah. It was a great experience. Uh, but you had to volunteer. I didn't get paid. It was all volunteer. Work, so. It's a good experience. That's a, that's a, a paid learning experience. 
it, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. But uh, and it, it was a life experience as well. So mm. it would cost me to go up and hotels. It's something that developed me as a as a practitioner. Mm, definitely. Right, Sean. Listen, mate. It's been awesome catching up with you. We've had some great uh, material discussed here tonight. And um, I wish you the best of luck for the business. Um, I think it's yeah. is it April the 12th you can open back up? Fingers, Fingers crossed. Mm. Really yeah, it should be. Toes, legs, everything will cross all of yeah. it. All the best for the future. Okay, thanks for coming on the podcast. And, uh, and I'll see you soon. I'm just going to hit the stop record button and we'll stay on and have a quick chat. Yeah, no worries. Cheers, buddy. Thank you very much.